people are um, cognitively lazy, I suppose. Mm. Uh, and so it's a lot easier to um, think about what we, we, in complex science, we call the, uh, the adjacent possible. Essentially, what is it can be defined as what can come to be in any given context. Um, and thinking beyond that is very difficult. So it, it, re it requires a fair bit of thought uh, and imagination. And a lot of people are sort of hesitant to do that for whatever reason, which is unfortunate. Attention all citizens of the future. Buckle up and step into our time tunnel of imagination to join us on an extraordinary journey into the days of futures past. From the fantastical tales of Jules Verne and Isaac Asimov to Buck Rogers and the famous visions of the World's Fair, the future might not be evenly distributed, but it sure ain't what it used to be. So let's go to our guide, that excavator of the eventual, that historian of the hereafter, that recorder of retro futures, Theo Priestley. Hello and welcome to another Days of Future Past podcast. Here I have my special guest today, JP Castlin. JP, how are you? I'm very well, my friend. How are you? I'm great. I'm great, thanks. Do you want to tell everybody what you do? Because it's a long list of things. A long list of things. The, sh the very short version is that I'm a management consultant. The slightly longer version is a former lawyer working in merchant and acquisitions, eventually went into corporate governance, which became strategy. And then I've been doing strategy work for, well, a fair few years now, given how many gray hairs I have in my beard. Uh, and then author, speaker, um, educator, I suppose. Um, and I also do a, a newsletter, which is decently popular, called Strategy and Praxis. Um, so, yeah, you know, not a man of many talents, perhaps, but I do a lot of things. You've uh, you created a framework and you've got a book coming out as well, aren't you? Top and tailing. Yes, yes, sir, I do. So the I've created something called the ABCD framework, which is a new strategic framework that deals with uh, uncertainty or how to manage uncertainty. And it's based off of my experiences working in strategy, but also things like complexity science. And uh, I'm co-writing a book together with a guy called Stephen McCrone uh, on that framework, among other things. Um, so it'll be a, a paradigm shift in strategy based essentially almost entirely on practice, although it's, you know, got very strong theoretical roots as well. In the last year then, I mean, there just seems to be a, 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 a certain shift, especially to me. I mean, after I've been looking at what, retrofuturism and, you know, the 1950s and that certain era of optimism, mm -hmm. I just sense that there's a shift in terms of, in, from a strategic point of view, from optimism to almost cynicism and realism. Yes. Um where people are, I don't know, questioning what's happening more in business and, and technology especially and, and, and that shift um, in terms of adoption. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if that's the same kind of feeling that you've got. I'm more of a passive observer. You're right in the trenches. Um, yeah, well, I mean, yes, I think so. I think there are perhaps a gazillion reasons why. Uh, there's a lot of what one might call AI washing at the moment. Um, and the reason being that you can essentially add about 30% to the price of your services if you just call it AI. Um, so there is, you, you could argue that that's cynicism. I also think that there are larger movements. So if you um, look throughout, well, if you go back, let's say six, 70 years at least, right? Um, and you look at, for example, uh, movies, then you saw your optimism in the 50s and then it went into a kind of a realism in the 60s, 70s with a lot of brutal movies. And then there was a counter movement to that in the 80s. Uh, and now we're at a point where we've had the sort of, we're in the middle of something politically correct, I think. Yeah, what people look to call, call, call woke, I suppose. And then you're starting to see that counter movement again and counter movements, uh, you know, okay, I think you're you're going into more quote unquote realistic stuff. And, and that's both good and bad, I suppose, because... It's good to be grounded in reality, but also I think um, we're seeing the worst of people at the moment uh, a bit too often. Do you think then that by, by being so grounded in reality, we've kind of lost the focus in terms, well, I uh, lost our ability to just project further forward in the, in the next couple of years, and that doesn't, that's lost that sense of optimism then? 
Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, I think if you are um, if you are a business, which is where I tend to come from, then I think it makes sense to work in, in the present because that's what you have to deal with. But we are getting very close to um, what one might call short-termism, hmm. uh, where we only focus on, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow or today and tomorrow, as opposed to, you know, a week, two weeks, a month, a year down the line, which is going to be problematic because, and, you know, that goes, of course, outside of business, but um, it does set up future generations quite uh, poorly, so to speak, because, you know, the future is not ours, it's theirs, if that makes sense. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's a bit of a problem. What about yourself? What are you seeing? Um, so I'm I'm seeing so I'm seeing a mixture of things. One of them, uh, one of which is you know as a practicing futurist and and, and uh, similar to yourself, but in, in different in many ways. You know, I'm seeing a lot of businesses using futurism as um, a means to hit KPIs in the very short term. Right. Um, again, back to that kind of short termism, rather than using futurism to plan for events and 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 certainly look further forward than the next sort of quarter. Or certainly yeah. the next year, um, it almost feels like futurism has turned into a sort of six sigma black belt kind of exercise where it's all <laughs> numbers um, and uh, uh, and KPIs and how to actually hit those KPIs in the next year, um, rather than thinking, well, what could our, what could impact our business in the next five years and how should we prepare for that? Mm-hmm. So you know, one of the things I noticed was when pandemic hit everybody just scattered to the four winds and didn't have an absolute clue what to do. Um, yeah. And and yet I thought to myself, well, hang on a minute. If we're employing all these futurists and, and, and these strategists who are supposed to be planning for these events, how come nobody actually thought to implement or have something like this in, you know, in their little black book of, um, you know, yeah. disaster recovery kind of mm. thing. So I, I, I see the same kind of thing, which is short termism. Um, I see a lot of, um, in my profession, a lot of people just hunkering down and just looking at numbers rather than actually thinking up what the future could look like and what possible futures could look like and which are the preferable ones that each business or society or technological advancement should move towards. Um, yeah. And, and that, that, that to me is a problem. Um, and I, I, and I, this is why I've started to look backwards to see how we could go forwards. Because again, there was a kind of a un, what I call unbridled optimism or un, unbridled sort of imagination, where people imagined what future possibilities could look like, whether it was tied to technology or whether it was tied to society, right. um, and and use that as a springboard to develop a roadmap to basically head towards that because it was more desirable for society. Whereas now that kind of is just just chopped down, um, and and it's gone. And and I feel I don't know whether I don't know whether we should strive for more optimism again or whether it's just we are in this stuck in the cycle of short-termism and cynicism in terms of well the future the future looks dystopian and there's nothing i can do about it so i'm just going to let it ride over me yeah i mean it, it, i think it's a it's a very good question and it's an important one to ask because if you look i mean having said all this what well what i'm about to say i suppose we have to take into account the fact that that the u.s sent up a rocket to the moon i think this morning yeah less than an hour ago but you know if you look at the uh, the grand visions of the 50s and yes there was certain uh, optimism and, and positivity coming out of you know the end of at la- long last second world war and whatever else but you know you you had that kind of oh no we're actually going to go to the stars whereas these days that you know, the, the the space race, for example, is almost entirely driven now by Musk and Bezos. Mm. Um, and so, we, yeah, we do lose a bit of that. And um, it's, you know, it's a, again, it's a, it's a unfortunate because it does kind of take us towards, to your point, a future where everything is a bit gray and a bit dull and it's all about arms races and whatever else, which is, you know, perhaps the necessary context and or, or the tragic context in which we live and, and the necessary response to it but nonetheless it's kind of a downer to put it mildly yeah can you remember where you were in uh, 2020 and what you were doing uh yes because i'm a swede right so we didn't really have lockdown um so i was working i do client work um and then what, what happened with client work was eventually um once the financial realities of the early pandemic hit then they just you know cut all their consultants 
So that's my reality. Um, but then um, we had our daughter um, a year later in 2021. Um, and so, you know, coming out of the pandemic and working from home, I get to spend more time with her. So that was still a blessing. Um, what about yourself? I mean, you were in lockdown, right? Yeah, we were in lockdown. Um, so 2019 um, was the the year it hit. We were in lockdown. I th- in fact, I think we were just coming out of lockdown. And um, yeah, Christ, I, I, it's, it's, it's almost like a, a fading memory now. We were coming out of lockdown. I was actually doing some uh, work with a um, Norwegian uh, yeah. software company at that time. Uh, doing visualization for um, uh, the energy sector, uh, yeah, planning no. planning software. Um, but it's interesting because I, I was kind of like um, I, was, I was. I'm trying to sort of remember, you know, what were we doing in, in 2020 and what was actually projected for 2020 um, yeah. way back in the day. And um, there's a book that came out called The Usborne Book of the Future. It was published in 1979. Yeah. Um, and it had all these grand visions of what the future was going to look like in the you know in the, the 21st century, and one of the visions was uh, there were lunar Olympics. Now we're we're, uh, we're we're extremely far away from that right now, right. but um, um, in that scenario, um, Africa had their own uh, space base um, or spaceport where they launched their own. Um, uh, astronaut or what would you call it? astronaut athlete I don't know I don't even know what yeah, the, yeah. the correct term is but um, they launched it from Africa um, his name was uh, Yuri I think or uh, UT um, and he held the uh, Olympic flame or the lunar Olympic flame um, in a sort of sealed bubble so the flame wouldn't actually go out because obviously the moon has no surface um, and they were doing you know they had a um, uh, an Olympic stadium there on the moon and they were doing 14 metre high jumps and things like that and I, I, I find it fascinating to look back at you know that, that again that, that period of time where you have people imagining what they had no concept of how far away things were I mean that was 50 years when you look yeah. at it just nearly 50 years ago um, but even in that time the space race had actually kind of like slowed down an awful lot and we didn't have the uh, shuttle at that point. You know, there was no space program in a sense because once Apollo shut down, there was this period of absolutely nothing really um, in terms of um, uh, exploration or even uh, massive leaps forward until the space shuttle came back. Um, But it was interesting to to go through that book again and actually sort of understand what people were still imagining. But again, no concept of time frame or the reality of that time frame mm. um so that you know it's, it's interesting that we <laughs> we were stuck indoors but in the 70s they actually thought we were going to be living on the moon at that point yeah no but i also think that that's sort of a that's kind of i think what what futurism is when it's at its best mm. that kind of the dream so to speak because if you look at what predictions and quote about futurism that was during the pandemic um there were things like, so I do a lot of work in e-commerce uh, and digital retail. And um, what happened during the pandemic was that because because of lockdown, people had to buy stuff online, right? Mm. And that meant that we saw around 10 years worth of growth of e-commerce um, in three to four months. And a lot of people thought that, okay, well, this is just going to accelerate into forever. That was, you know, futurism and predictions at the moment, which is nonsensical. Um, but you get... Uh, even people like Mark Zuckerberg who said, so thought this was going to be a permanent acceleration. And so mm. uh, James Hankis and I, we created this thing called the, what we call the Zuckerberg Principle, which is when you uh, look into the future, you sh- can't be fooled by sort of short-term patterns. Um, and so I think that that contrast between that kind of prediction, which is nonsensical, and those kinds of dreams um, is also sort of, I think, where, where kind of futurism as, is at its worst and at its best, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, like again, that goes back to your um, well, it goes back to your point about short termism, yeah. But also the fact, again, back the, back to the point I was making about futurism, which is it was it's it's been distilled or watered down to trend spotting, yeah. Um, and of course, when you extrapolate a trend in the wrong way, um, you get the, the the sort of ideas of well, this is us. We're all going to be sitting online. Nobody's ever going to talk to each other, um, and it completely negates human nature. 
because yeah. when lockdown lifted, everybody just wanted to get outside, go to conferences, shake people's hands, see them, talk to them, and face to face, and you know, and and live life to the fullest again. Um, um, and I think that again, that goes back to futurism, but also that vision of life. Yeah. Like a, a lot of a lot of the what we see now in terms of uh, futurism or just prediction is trend spotting, but trend spotting in the here and now. Yeah. So everybody talks about, you know, metaverse is still on, on the agenda. AI very much on the agenda. Yeah. You know, so Web3 is still floating around, you know, those kind of things. But it, they don't, you know, AR, VR, spatial computing. Yeah. But these are things that we already know about. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and and this is the problem is that we, we seem to be very grounded or, or, or I guess grounded is the right word, grounded in the here and now rather than projecting forward and, yeah. and having those visions of the next 50 years. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's true. I mean, uh, people are um, cognitively lazy, I suppose. Mm. Um, and so it's a lot easier to um, think about well, we, we in complex science we call the uh, the adjacent possible essentially what is it can be defined as what can come to be in any given context um and thinking beyond that is very difficult so it, it, re- it requires a fair bit of thought uh and imagination and a lot of people are sort of hesitant to do that for whatever reason which is unfortunate so what's your um what's your thoughts around retrofuturism and just futurism in general because you yeah know- no, no. Um, right, so it ties to that, I suppose, um, my sort of caveat coming out of complexity science, which is that, um, per definition, the future is not something that we can predict, right? Mm. It's literally impossible a priori. And so at any given point, as kind of as I was alluding to, we can think of what may come to be, but our visions tend to be limited by either what we know or what we are ignorant of. So, right, mm. so for example, to use... Uh, your examples, you know, you can have something like flying cars, right? And most of us now uh, probably know that they are possible because companies have built them, but we're kind of ignorant of the realities of wide-scale manufacturing and the implications of an airborne populace and whatever else. And so we're dealing with something that is practically possible, but practically improbable in the current context. And this is, you know, the way it always is. As I mentioned, the idea is impossible. Um, And the space of what is possible right, is dramatically larger than the space of the actual. In other words, what can come to be versus what mm. actually does come to be. Um, and the way that I've explained it in the past when I do talks is that you can think of it as a row of doors. You're standing in front of a row of doors. To your right, as far as the eye can see, you have doors. To your left, as far as the eye can see, you have doors. If you open a door up, another row of doors will sort of appear, and some will be familiar, and others will be brand new. And each time you open up a new door and step inside, the same thing will happen, right? So when we look to the future, we tend to be limited by the doors that, that we see. Um, exactly to your point, we look at short-termism and the thing that is here. Um, the problem, of course, is that those that we see are not all that there are, mm. or not, nor can we see beyond the doors that we have to open typically. So when we read, speaking of sort of Retrofuturism and things like that. So we might read books like, you know, The Machine Stops by Forster or Huxley's Brave New World or Bonner's Stand on Zanzibar. And we kind of marvel at the things that they got right, thinking, you know, how could they know? But we ignore all the things that they got wrong and all the things that mm-hmm. other authors got wrong. And so what tends to end up happening is um, there are a lot of things that that sort of came to be that nobody predicted, Right. So history is literally with predictions of what would be, it never came to pass, but they are numbered by orders of magnitude, but what came to be, but nobody foresaw. And so we need to, when we talk about futurism, it's about imagining those kinds of things. Uh, and and a, a large reason why, well, partly again, because the future is literally impossible to break, um, but also people don't think, you know, imaginably, they don't think beyond those things, except in typically in works and literature and whatever else. Um, and so when I look at those kinds of, of works and content, to use a modern word, I like things that are um, dreams more so than predictions and kind of escapism more than realism. Um, so I, I do works like um, Fritz Lang's uh, Metropolis, for example, or Ridley mm-hmm. Blade Runner, although somewhat ironically because 
Of course, the, the sort of the source material is called uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Um, but they're kind of extensions of, of past presence, if that makes sense, right? And they kind of make sense to us because they're about deep human desires and you know those roots of behavior that goes most deep into our collective family tree. But they never made me dream the way that some futurists do or the work, you know, works like Star Wars, especially the games like Knights of the Old Republic, where you can actually go into space and you can explore. And you can do things that are far beyond the present. Mm. Uh, and <clears throat> same thing with, you know, games like Mass Effect, for example. And, and I remember when I was a kid, I did two things. I read a lot and I did a lot of sports. But the things that stand out to me are the video games in terms of futurism. And, and I realized as well while I was doing sort of research for this that I think that still applies. Um, so what are your thoughts on this? I mean, given especially that you are, have sort of worked in the, the video game space. Um, for more, you know, wild dreams? Yeah, I think, I think it depends on the entertainment medium that, that allows hmm. you to basically, it gives you that freedom to, to, to think and explore and dream up things. Um, and, you know, I think the whole science fiction genre in itself allows that escapism and you're not i mean apart from hard, hard sci-fi which is obviously you know you get the, yeah. the you know the absolute purists who want to know what the physical you know what are the physics equations and the chemical you yeah, know yeah. the bonds of this particular scenario and this would never happen you get people nitpicking well, whereas you know obviously um you know when you mention star wars and, and things like that um these things are fantastical and ships don't move like that in the you know in the in the real world um, yeah. But we allow that imagination to draw us into worlds that could exist at some point, but we just don't yeah. have the gumption to actually figure it out. Um, um, Mass Effect, great, great um, uh, sci-fi, space sci-fi. Um, I like Elite Dangerous because it's it's oh, yeah. kind of grounded in reality, but it's still yeah. you know projected forward where the, you know this this could be the future where humanity is has explored the stars and this is what things are like. Like The Expanse, you know, The, yeah. the Expanse is another one where um, it gives you that vision of what's going to happen in the next three, four hundred years, shall we say, and, you know, we're mining yeah. um, series um, and create a base there and stuff like that. But I think the other thing which I was talking to Charlie Finks about was that um, it's very mundane and boring. When you get yeah. down to it, when you get down to the reality uh, and peel back the, well, we've got to space, what do we do next? Then it's like, yeah. well, we've got trade, we've got mining, we've yeah. got uh, worker strikes, which is, you know, we've basically dragged everything from Earth and we've just put it into another context. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, again, that's human struggle um, in yeah. terms of that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one because it's that thing of, you know, if we are far enough removed, do we still bring you know, everything from the present, if that makes sense. And, yeah. you know, there's this, Neil deGrasse Tyson likes to point out when talking about aliens, right? So the difference between, you know, a pig and a human in, D in terms of DNA is, you know, what, a percentage, something like mm. that. It, uh, uh, for, <clears throat> one, you know, nine to nine percent the same, thereabouts, nine, six, nine, nine, something like that. Imagine if you have had an entity that was 100% different from a human being. We wouldn't we probably wouldn't be able to recognize it as, you know, an entity, so to speak. And and it, the same might be true if we're talking about the future. I mean, it's it, there's so many quote unquote doors that have to be opened. We're so far removed from the present that, you know, we might not recognize all of those uh, things that we see today. And, and I think, again, that's kind of uh, where science fiction gets interesting, mm -hmm. uh, particularly uh, for me anyway. Bioshock was another really interesting oh, one yeah, because yeah. That, cause that gave a future. And I don't know if you've been watching Hello Tomorrow as well on Apple TV. Uh, no, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's basically retro future. Um, you know, back in the fifties uh, uh, and the World's Fair kind of sort of scenario. Uh -huh. um, but everything that you saw in the World's Fair has now actually come true. So you have these what? kind of sort of uh, Art Deco flying robots and things like that. Uh, and I think that's what really attracted me to Bioshock as well, is that it was uh, an alternate history or alternate future where the things that we took for granted back in the 40s and the 50s were actually adopted and you had that Art Deco architecture yeah. and the Art Deco kind of um, uh, technology side of things. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I like that kind of extension of projecting forward from the past in terms of well if if all those visions from the world's fair and world of tomorrow and futurama came true what would the world mm -hmm. look like today yeah 
Yeah, I mean, they're interesting counterfactuals, uh, if nothing else. You know, mm. if we took that to be true, then then what would happen today and so on and so forth. And I think that's kind of been, uh, it's a very common theme, I think, in science fiction. So if you take something like um, The Running Man with Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Mm. Uh, set in the future, but if you look at the interfaces on the computers, for example, it looks like in the 80s when they created it, because they just think that that design is the peak of design and therefore it'll be the same thing in the future. Um, and so sort of to, to play around with that and see, okay, so what would the implications be, I think are, are quite interesting. Uh, and again, it allows you to sort of play around with ideas and, and come up with new things and new ideas that are, again, not necessarily rooted in the present. Um, which is uh, interesting. Yeah, uh, there was, uh, if you look back, there was obviously video phones. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, and these things have been uh, talked about since the, you know, the early 1900s or early 20th century, you know, 1910 yeah. or whatever. Um, and people talking on specific devices. And and again, I think there was there's an earlier cartoon where there are two uh, ladies in a park and they're holding up what looks like a mirror talking into it and the mirror is obviously a projection of what's on the other side really? and yet in the 50s it was about miniature tv sets it's set in you know bakelite phones um and i actually found um i think it was 1917 again 1979 there was an attempt to make a, a video phone Mm -hmm. um, much in the same way that was projected from the 50s, you know, Bakelite, um, fixed line set, had a tiny TV in it, didn't sell at all. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and, and that was based on the interface. So, because they, they just thought, well, all people will want is a TV set into a phone. Yeah. Um, whereas now it's completely different because it actually goes in with the user interface. It goes in with the, the you know the tiny camera, pinhole camera. Yeah. Um, and obviously the infrastructure that exists today, which is you know five uh, G or four G rather than yeah, fixed yeah. lines. So. Yeah, but I mean, like that that's essentially the the adjacent possible in a nutshell, right? So every piece of new technology has to be built on an existing piece of technology or existing pieces, mm. right? Um, and so when we come up with a new idea, that opens up new doors, and these doors open up to new doors and so on and so forth. So, so you get the idea of, you know, talking into a mirror, basically. But then you get all of these new adjacent technologies that, that turn into from, from this to this to this to this, and then they eventually end up with a fucking iPhone, right? <laughs> <laughs> Something that, you know, if you told someone 30 years ago that you'd have all of that in the phone, people just would think you're, you would be insane, right? Mm. Nonetheless, that's where we are. So, you know. Is there anything, any piece of technology or, or any any vision that you saw as a child um, that that hasn't come true that you wish, or hasn't come true yet, but you wish was here now? Well, I mean, I think space travel, because I think uh, instinctively, I'm not sure whether it's actually, I haven't thought about it, whether it's true as, as uh, of human being as a species. I, I would imagine so from a sort of, for evolutionary purposes, but we kind of like exploring, right? Hmm. As it used to be that we explored the world. Uh, now we explored most of the world, you know, perhaps save the sea from, from the seas and, and sort of that thing. But the next paradigm, the next step was always into space. Um, and as a kid going into space, you know, again, influenced by all the works that I mentioned, was the big thing. And I think we haven't really gotten that much you know, farther than where we were, you know, you mentioned the 50s, but mm. basically, right? So I think that's that's the big thing. Um, interstellar travel, uh, I think, is the big thing that I sort of dreamed of when I was a kid. What about you? Um, probably more of the same, actually. Um, yeah, no. I think, you know, I've always been, you know, influenced by science fiction and, and, and movies, and, and yeah. space has always been the one that, I wish we had been further forward with. Mm -hmm. uh, I would still like to see in my lifetime, the remainder of my lifetime, uh, um, you know, a base, a permanent base on the moon, Please. and not just a tin can that you know some astronauts sit in for three months at a time and then head yeah. back, but something much bigger and brighter that you could actually look up That's... from your home or whatever, you know, and and actually see twinkling lights on yeah. the moon. I think that would be that. That to me is. Um, and another, maybe another, you know, a couple of space stations and, and one in um, lunar orbit as well, because uh, to me, there's missing huge amounts of missing infrastructure yeah. between 
Earth and the Moon and getting heavy industry into space and actually understanding what we need to do to build another civilization or yeah. part of our civilization elsewhere. Um, it, it kind of annoys me at the moment. And although it's 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 interesting because it's counterintuitive because being a futurist, you're like, oh, we must do asteroid mining and we must visit Io and we must, you know, uh, put, a, put something, you know, a balloon on, on Venus, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, these are fantastical visions, but very impractical ones to get us to that point. We have yeah. to build the stepping stones first. Um, and there's not enough of the stepping stones in place, which which kind of... You know, it makes me, you know, it makes me weak, I suppose. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, but again, it, it's, it's that thing of, of the adjacent possible. Eventually, you're going to get enough stepping stones. Mm. Uh, but that requires you to have that vision, I think, to, you know. I mean, a lot of it is sort of certain to listen and, you know, you know uh, what is called acceptation, which is a radical repurposing of existing technology, and that tends to happen by chance more so than anything. But, but nonetheless, I think it's important to dream, mm. you know, for various reasons. Well, uh, maybe our children will actually see it more than we will. Yeah, yeah. I mean, hopefully. Um, and, and if they do, at least, you know, it, it, we're leaving behind a better world than, than we seem to be leaving behind at the moment. Mm. Yeah. All power to dreams. JP, yeah. um, thanks for taking some time today to have a chat. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Um, where can people find you? Um, easiest is uh, on Twitter at JP Castlin or um, via the newsletter, which is Strategy in Praxis. That's not practice, but praxis. So P R A X I S uh, dot substack dot com, or just find me on LinkedIn. But usually that's the case. Okay, JP. Again, once again, thank you very much indeed for taking some time to chat. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Uh, that's it for another episode of Days of Futures Past. You'll find uh, everything in the show notes, including links to where you can find JP. I've been Theo Priestley. Look forward to seeing you again on the next episode. This is Days of Futures Past, signing off, when we'll once again peel back the curtain on more lost futures. Stay tuned, and remember, the future may be here, but the past never fades. Until next time. Days of Futures Past was brought to you by Theo Priestley, keynote speaker, author, and retrofuturist. If you'd like to appear as a guest and reminisce about futures gone by, get in touch. I've been your radio host, Andrew Helbig. Goodbye for now.